Democrats once saw outrage as a path to midterm success, but is that outrage starting to backfire? I'm Tanya Rivero, in for Elaine Quijano, and this is Red and Blue. The messaging isn't as clear to the communities that we're trying to represent. Are we fighting or not? Ahead on Red and Blue, Democratic Party infighting breaks into the open on topics ranging from the Supreme Court to immigration. We need to rebuild our immigration system from top to bottom, starting by replacing ICE with something that reflects our morality. Abolishing ICE will accomplish nothing unless we change the Trump policies. Democrats are even arguing over arguing. I strongly disagree with those who advocate harassing folks if they don't agree with you. Leadership like Chuck Schumer's will do anything that they think is necessary to protect their leadership. But we begin at Monday's White House briefing where Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders weighed in on Democrats' approach to immigration. Uh, the president last Thursday wrote on Twitter, House Republicans should pass the strong but fair immigration bill known as Good Lat 2 in their afternoon vote today. <laughs> then on Sunday, he wrote on Twitter, I never pushed the Republicans in the House to vote for the immigration bill, either Good Lat 1 or 2. Why would the president lie about something like that? Uh, he didn't. The president has talked all along. We've laid out the priorities and the principles that we support, that we wanted to see reflected in legislation, that at the same time the president wasn't aggressively lobbying members because he knew that Democrats in the Senate still were unwilling to actually come to the table and focus on solutions rather than playing political games. And Democrats have made it abundantly clear that they don't actually want to fix problems. They just want to talk about uh, this all the way, I guess, for some reason, they think this is a good issue for them, although it isn't. It's been just a few weeks since images of children in cages took over the national conversation. Elected Democrats converged on the southern border with a united message of outrage. But since then, Democrats' disagreements about where to go next have broken into the open. A growing number this weekend said immigration and customs enforcement should be abolished. New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who is considered a possible 2020 presidential candidate, said on Facebook, quote, we need to abolish ICE and went on to call the agency a cruel deportation force. But other Democrats aren't sure Gillibrand has a winning strategy. I want to ask you, sir, do you agree with your colleague, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, that we should get rid of immigration and customs enforcement or ICE, as that agency is known? Abolishing ICE will accomplish nothing unless we change the Trump policies. If you abolish ICE now, you still have the same president with the same failed policies. Um, whatever you replace it with is just going to still reflect what this president wants to do. The party's approach to the Supreme Court vacancy has brought new attention to these divides. The Washington Post's Michael Schurer summarizes the party's dispute this way in a new piece titled A Bad Week for Democrats gives rise to a big problem. Outrage could become an obstacle in midterms. Michael Schurer is with us from Washington now. He's a national political reporter for The Washington Post. And we're also joined by Molly Hooper. She is a CBSN political con contributor and Capitol Hill reporter for The Hill. Let me start with you, Michael. Why are Democrats divided on what they want to do to the agency? It's more a tactical and a messaging division, I think, than anything else. The, the term abolish ICE suggests getting rid of all in, internal to the country immigration enforcement. And really, there are not any Democratic politicians who've proposed that. What they've said is they want to get rid, some have said they want to get rid of the agency as a way of getting rid of the tactics the agency has started to use under the Trump administration. Um, and, and other Democrats have pointed out that as a, as a soundbite, that doesn't play well in a lot of places and allows for uh, easy characterization by Republicans. And this all gets back to this, this underlying question. There's an enormous amount of anger uh, and frustration in the Democratic Party right now. And, and with the Supreme Court uh, vacancy, with uh, the continued de detention of children separated from their parents uh, at the border, Democrats are concerned that it's going to come out in mm -hmm. ways that actually hurt their election uh, 
prospects instead of help. And, and Michael, I do think also that a lot of Americans aren't quite aware of the difference between Border Patrol and Border Patrol right. agents and ICE. These are two totally distinct organizations. Yeah, the easy way to think about it is that ICE it deals with immigration enforcement inside the country and the Border Patrol patrols the borders. Um, so, so even if you did get rid of ICE, and like I said, the Democrat proposals are for basically reorienting the bureaucracy, getting rid of the name, putting the bureaucracy in, in, in uh, or the same enforcement tools in different agencies or in a new agency. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't affect what's happening on the border. Right, and ICE is a relatively new organization, correct? It was formed what in two thousand and three. Yeah, it was formed after the nine eleven attacks, uh, when mm -hmm. the Department of Homeland Security took in a, a bunch of agencies and they they reoriented how they patrolled the border and dealt with immigration. And Molly, I'd like to bring you in now. How are Democrats on Capitol Hill reacting to this debate that some say is splitting the party? Well, you know, it's interesting. If you look back at 2014 and, and immigration was an issue, obviously, then um, you see something very similar happening to certain party leaders like Joe Crowley, who lost his election in New York. Um, that happened to Eric Cantor back in 2014, who lost to this outside, you know, individual, Dave Bratt, who had a lot of energy, has a lot of energy, and was um, seen sort of as this new, you know, as a continuation of the Tea Party and an increase in, you know, taking, um, you know, less establishment, non-establishment, taking on non-establishment figures in the party. And so when you're hearing Democrats on Capitol Hill reacting to um, abolishing ICE, um, you know, there's a, it's a very loaded question because um, immigration played a key role in Eric Cantor's defeat back in 2014. And it's a key, it's going to be playing a key issue in what's going on right now within the party um, for Democrats. Democrats. And so you'll see different reactions. As we heard Richard Blumenthal on on CBS Face the Nation Sunday <laughs> saying, yes, there you go, saying, um, you know, it, it will do nothing unless you, you get rid of the Trump policies. And when it comes to the zero tolerance policy, that's that's actually the DOJ. That's that's Jeff Sessions carrying out those orders, um, you know, via Border Patrol. So right. again, it's, it's so a many little distinct convoluted. organizations involved exactly. in the overarching immigration policy. Uh, Michael, I want to get back to you for a second. A Harvard-Harris poll found that 69 percent of Americans and 59 percent of Democrats oppose disbanding immigration and customs enforcement. With that in mind, why do you think some Dems are still calling for an end to the agency? Is it just playing well to this growing sort of left-wing base? I think it's you, you had a clip at the top there of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez saying Democrats need to start fighting. And I think that's really what it's about. You know, Republicans mm -hmm. have said for a long time we need to abolish the IRS, yeah. abolish the Department of Education. And I think Democrats just want a fighting message. And, and when they hear that aggression, a lot of activists are attracted to it. It clearly worked in her House uh, primary fight. And in Queens, it clearly won't work in a lot of districts that Democrats are trying to pick up. Uh, this mm -hmm. this uh, this fall. So, you know, it's, it's about the, the party sort of coming to terms with allowing a diversity of voices, a diversity of tactics, mm -hmm. and then hoping that Republicans uh, are, are, are not able to, you know, magnify the more extreme elements and convince the country that's what the Democratic Party is. But Michael, your article, though, seems to take the tact that this is dividing the Democratic Party and is ultimately weakening the party. But some are saying, hey, actually, this is energizing the party. Right. And if those on the, you know, if those old school Democrats would actually just listen to what the younger <laughs> kids are saying, that it would actually help the party. Well, I think it's an open question. It's clearly also mm -hmm. energizing the party. There was a poll out uh, today, actually, that showed a 17-point advantage when you ask, are you more uh, excited to vote for your, your congressman or woman this fall than normal? Democrats are far more excited right now, and, and it's because of the same energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that energy is a huge asset for the Democratic Party. The question is whether that energy will also uh, create liabilities for the party, you know, in the, in the form of Maxine Waters and in, in the form of these sort of debates. Right. Now, uh, Molly, as we've been discussing, yeah. perhaps one of the biggest shakeups to the Democratic Party's power structure recently yeah. was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's victory mm -hmm. over Congressman Joe Crowley. We interviewed her right here on CBSN, and on Sunday's Meet the Press, Ocasio-Cortez discussed what contributed to her win. Let's listen for a moment. 
I do think that there was certainly a lack of presence, and that was a big part of of my win. It was a, there was, I think, a lack of listening on the ground, a lack of going to the grocery store and saying, "Hey, how are you doing?" And that is an important part of representation because we have a lot of work that we have to do here in D.C. But that work needs to be rooted in the communities that we have been elected to represent. And so, Molly, does she have a point? I mean, she did not take one corporate Absolutely. dollar for her entire campaign. So is there a concern among Democratic voters, especially the younger ones, that their representatives are out of touch? Well, and I wanted to say absolutely, because there is a correlation. If you look at what happened to Eric Cantor, who was then the number two Republican in the House behind Speaker Boehner, sort of at the time, seen as somebody who would, you know, fill Boehner's shoes when he retired, he lost in a primary to um, an economics professor who had the energy, who has the energy, as I said, um, and was able to defeat him. Um, a guy who, who taught students uh, was on the ground, while Eric Cantor, who was a prolific fundraiser, was going across the country raising money for the party. And that's something that I think happened to Joe Crowley. If you look at his position, he was sort of in line to go to take over um, the leader position from Speaker, excuse me, former Speaker, current minority leader Nancy Pelosi, um, who hopes to be Speaker again one day soon. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you know, he was out there helping candidates across the country. But you have to remember that these members are running to to represent their own district. And even though you feel like you're safe, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And again, there is a a lot of energy. And that's where I think um, when we see, you know, members going home for their district work periods, they are legitimately going home this year because there are so many concerns that um, there could be primary challenges right. either to the right or to the left. But here comes here comes the challenge as well. In a district like Joe Crowley's that's traditionally, I mean, it's a Democratic district and, and um, you know, it looks like Alicia has, ha Alexia has the, you know, will, will, will win that race. Um, you look at other districts across the country where there could be a competitive general election race if the Democrat um, who wins the primary is is to the left of the the district and that and that could be a concern as well but again we'll have to see how that plays out yeah come it'll, November. it'll be interesting to see if uh, you know lawmakers and from both parties will sort of heed the warning that exactly. uh, the, the shot across the bow there from the 14th district so Michael I, I want to ask you do you think Democratic Party leadership is partially responsible for Crowley's loss uh, it, you mean, well, Crowley is responsible for Crowley's loss, and he was part of Democratic Party leadership. I mean, I, I think there there is this broader issue, which I think your question is getting at, of whether the leaders in the House are just too old and out of touch. And you do have a number of septuagenarians there who will have to fight, uh, uh, assuming Democrats are able to retake the House, to maintain their position. I think there's a lot of desire for some fresh blood, uh, mm -hmm. and and they're going to have to solve that. I mean, it, it may be that Pelosi can hold on to being speaker again, but it, it's very unlikely that she'll be surrounded by people her age uh, at the top of the party if that does happen. Now, I don't think that's an issue that was really at top of mind in the Queen in Queens last Tuesday when people voted. I think you know she was uh, Ocasio Cortez was an incredibly attractive, compelling candidate with a great mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. uh, who was who was basically promising to bring politics back to the local community, uh, you know, after a, quite a long time of it not really being there. Uh, and, and, and I think that's what won the day. Right. But it's so interesting to see how everyone has focused on her. It makes you wonder whether there is something of the zeitgeist about her, her victory. Um, at a rally last week in North Dakota, President Trump commented on the race and had this to say about House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. I want to keep Nancy Pelosi right where she is with Maxine Waters. I want to keep Nancy Pelosi. Please, I want to make a plea to my Democrat friends. Please, please, please don't remove Nancy Pelosi. She should be where she is. And please keep Maxine Waters on the air as your face and your mouthpiece. For the Democrat Party, please. So, Molly, is this kind of taunting by the president going to help or hurt moderate Democrats? And is it something that candidates on the left will use to campaign against them? Well, well, here's where, here's where that Democrats in disarray storyline comes in, because... 
You do have a number of Democrats who represent states, and this is Senate, Senate races, um, who represent states that Trump won by almost double digits. And, you know, the more you hear Democrats and progressive Democrats coming out saying they want to abolish ICE, mm -hmm. I mean, look at what the president was doing this past weekend. He was saying, keep it up, keep, you know, again, sort of a, a, a bit of taunting, but basically saying, you know, Democrats keep calling for the abolishment of ICE. It'll help our Republican candidates in districts and states where I won. One, because, again, there are more moderate, you know, they call them the so-called flyover country. I, I'm not sure if, if that's um, a positive or a negative thing, but the, I'm from California, <laughs> to be, <laughs> just so you know, West Coast girl here. Um, you know, these, these, these states and these districts um, that aren't as left or as conservative as various parts of the country, um, in, in key places where members and Republicans need to pick up seats and Democrats want to hold on to their seats, right. and that could be hurtful or, or harmful to them. But I want to ask you, Michael, so aside from the sort of abolish ICE rallying cry, which is, like you said, a little bit of a marketing, uh, you know, the, this new left is sort of talking also about universal health care, free public education, things that conceivably could appeal to a certain amount of the Trump base, especially those who are not as economically prosperous. So could this move toward the left actually help the party gain some of those voters? It could, but you know, I think the remarkable thing about the primaries we've seen so far in the Democratic Party is that even though you've had a general shift to the left in terms of the policies that the party is embracing, it hasn't really been an ideological fight. There's just a couple examples where the left candidate was able to overtake the sort of establishment-backed, more centrist candidate. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of these cases, the the, the primary winner in, in the races that matter has been the candidate that the party wants. And they're candidates who are winning on biography. They're, you know, women who are accomplished in the military. They're African-Americans. They're Latinos. Uh, they're businessmen. They're vet veterans. I mean, so, you know, that's the thing that's been driving most of these uh, primaries. Now, I think that'll change when we get into towards 2020, I think that is the point at which the Democratic Party really has to flesh out what it's about, right. what policy it embraces. And it's certainly going to be more to the left, but it's just not clear that those ideological divisions mm -hmm. are as divisive as they were for Republicans, for example, when, when you know, Dave Bratt won uh, many years ago. Uh, Michael, before we go, I want to ask you, though, you, you called this, um, this anger sort of on the left a liability. Why is that? I said it was a potentially a liability, and that's because you could have a situation in which Democrats turn on each other mm -hmm. or uh, play into a characterization by President Trump that alienates middle-of-the-road voters in, in a lot of these suburban districts that will decide uh, which party controls Congress next, so next fall. And, the, and the, these are not places like Queens. So on this question, question of civility versus incivility, you know, a lot of people yeah. say, well, the Democrats have to show some muscle. You know, this is not the time to be civil. Where do you think the, li the greater liability lies for the Democratic Party? Well, I don't, I'm not sure it's an either or. And I, I know Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi would agree that you can be aggressive and you can fight uh, without hounding people as they mm -hmm. shop at Macy's, uh, as Maxine Waters suggested. And, and I, you saw very quickly last week the leader of both the House and the Senate Democrats come out and say ma what Maxine Waters had done was wrong and mm -hmm. we can't do that. She hasn't backed down, but you haven't seen any Democrats follow her into that breach. So right. I, I think that message has been sent pretty clearly within the party. All right. Michael and Molly, thanks to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is planning a third trip to Pyongyang to discuss a proposed timeline for North Korean denuclearization. As Paula Reed reports, this news comes as concerns grow about whether Kim Jong-un is really willing to give up his nuclear weapons. I made a deal with him. President Trump told Fox News Sunday he trusted Kim Jong-un would dismantle his nuclear program, but admitted the deal they agreed to in Singapore last month could fall apart. Have I been in deals? Have you been in things where people didn't work out? It's possible. That's far from the president's confident tone arriving home from the summit. There is no longer a nuclear threat. But new satellite imagery shows expansion of a missile manufacturing site capable of producing missiles that could hit U.S. military installations in Asia. 
The North Koreans were finishing construction of the plant around the same time President Trump was meeting with Kim in Singapore. It goes to show um, the intentions and expectations that the North Koreans had uh, going into the meeting. David Schmerler is a researcher at the Middlebury Institute. It shows that they're uh, fully committed to maintaining their ballistic missile program. This comes on top of a Washington Post report that U.S. intelligence believe that the North Koreans are planning to conceal the number of warheads in their arsenal. Well, I don't want to comment on that specific report. On Sunday's Face the Nation, the president's national security advisor, John Bolton, would not address the reporting, arguing the administration had a plan to fully dismantle the nuclear program. We have developed a program. I'm sure that uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo will be discussing this with the North Koreans in the near future about uh, really how to dismantle all of their WMD and ballistic missile programs in a year. Also on Face the Nation, Bolton addressed the planned summit between President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin next month. Bolton met with Putin last week and said the presidents would discuss, quote, a whole range of issues. One of them could be Russia's annexation of Crimea, which President Trump appeared to leave the door open to recognizing last week. Here's what Bolton said about that on Sunday. In Air Force One this week, President Trump when he was speaking to reporters, seemed to leave the door open to recognizing Russia's annexation of Crimea, uh, saying, we'll have to see what happens when the issue comes up in the meeting. Is the U.S. endorsing the idea that international borders can be redrawn by force? Is this actually a topic? No, that's not the position of the United States, but I think uh, the president... Which is why it was newsworthy when he said it. Well, I don't know that that's what he said. I think, he's, I think the president often says, we'll see, to show that he's willing to talk to uh, foreign leaders about a range of issues and, and hear their perspective. Uh, President Putin was pretty clear with me about it, and, and my response was, we're going to have to agree to disagree on Ukraine. But that's not up for negotiation. That's not the position of the United States. Right. But saying we'll see suggests might be. Well, we'll see. And in 2014, Bolton appeared to support a different position on Crimea. He wrote in a Los Angeles Times op-ed, quote, the West's pathetically inadequate response to Crimea's annexation undoubtedly convinced Putin that he could get away with taking more Ukrainian territory. And coming up, President Trump says he's interviewed four potential Supreme Court picks already and plans to interview two or three more before announcing his choice next week. Plus, who's responsible for protecting midterm elections from meddling? We're breaking down what tech companies and law enforcement are doing ahead of November. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue on CBSN. President Trump has started interviewing potential Supreme Court justices. The White House hopes to replace retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy before midterm elections in November, while Republicans still hold a slim majority in the Senate. Weijia Zhang has the latest from Washington. Many, many President Trump has launched his search for the next justice of the Supreme Court. During the morning, I interviewed and met with four potential justices of our great Supreme Court. Uh, they are outstanding people. They are really incredible people. The president says he will meet with two or three more candidates and make a decision over the next few days. He has also met with key senators whose support he'll need in replacing retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy. Among them, Republican Senator Susan Collins, who drew a line on the issue of abortion rights. A candidate for this important position who would overturn Roe v. Wade would not be acceptable to me. Roe versus Wade legalized abortion in 1973. President Trump says he will not question potential nominees on their views about it, saying it would be inappropriate to discuss. But Democrats point out the president will have that information without asking. He doesn't need to ask that question because those nominees on his list have already been screened by the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation and other outside groups. CBS News has learned that D.C. Circuit Court Judge Brett Kavanaugh and Chicago Circuit Court Judge Amy Coney Barrett are among the leading contenders. The president hopes to have a justice confirmed for the start of the next session in October. Weijia Zhang joins us now from the White House. Weijia, President Trump told us that he met with four of his candidates to replace Anthony Kennedy. 
Do we have any indication who we met with? You know, President Trump described these four as outstanding and incredible people, but the White House is being very quiet about exactly who they are. In fact, just a short time ago during the White House press briefing, we tried to press uh, Sarah Sanders about the identities of these judges, and she would only say that they were each here and met with the president for 45 minutes. But of course, we know that they came from a longer list of 25 judges the president actually rolled out last year, and now that list has been whittled down to about six or seven who he plans to meet with. So in addition to these four in the coming days, he will speak with two or three more people before making his decision and then announcing that decision exactly one week from today. Uh, but as far as the identities of who was here today, uh, Sanders would not commit to any of that. And Weijia, what do we know about exactly what President Trump is looking for in a Supreme Court nominee? You know, obviously, this is a huge decision for the president, but it's not his decision alone uh, in terms of who else is advising him. We know that uh, White House counsel Don McGahn is actually leading the selection and confirmation process, and other advisors are as well. One judicial advisor who has been in touch with the president tells CBS News that there are three main things that he is looking for, and that is someone who is really qualified, who has the credentials. We know the president often talks about experience and resume and the, the elite credentials that really make a difference. Uh, he's looking for someone who, in his words, is not weak, meaning won't be afraid to carry out tough decisions uh, no matter what they are. Uh, no matter what the court of public opinion says. And he is looking for someone who will interpret the law the way the framers intended it to be, which is interesting because that leaves some room for interpretation. But the bottom line is he does want someone who's going to carry out his agenda, right? Because this is going to be a legacy for the president uh, and all the cases to come that this uh, justice will rule on will define his chapter of America. We just, Senator Susan Collins, a key Republican swing vote, has said that she will not vote to confirm a nominee who supports overturning Roe v. Wade. But isn't it possible she votes for a nominee who refuses to state his or her position? You know, I think we should expect Senator Collins and other moderate Republicans to grill the nominee during their confirmation hearing about Roe v. Wade. But unless this person explicitly says, I will not overturn it, they're going to have to rely on other things uh, that the nominee says, mainly about how they interpret standing law. You know, uh, Senator Collins drew this line with Roe v. Wade, not only based on the content of the case, but she said that she could not uh, vote for a judge who did not respect established law. And of course, uh, Roe v. Wade has been the law since 1973. And so again, if the, the nominee does not come out and say what they plan to do for that specific case, the questions will then have to become, are they willing to overturn laws that have been on the books in this country for decades? You know, Sanders was also asked about this because President Trump says he will not explicitly ask the candidates uh, that he's talking to about this case, but it doesn't matter because they have been vetted by conservative right. groups. There is no confusion about where they stand on abortion rights. And so the question for him is whether he wants to overturn Roe v. Wade and whether that is his ultimate goal, like he promised on the campaign trail. We just at the White House. Thank you. President Trump will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, Finland in two weeks. Mr. Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, said Sunday that the president will bring up Russian election meddling at their meeting. The election meddling issue was definitely something we talked about, and I thought it was significant. Now, meddling now. Yes, absolutely. Meddling, meddling in the 2016 election and, uh, and our concern about what they're doing in the 2018 election. And what President Putin said, through a translator, of course, but what he said was uh, there was no meddling in 2016 by the Russian state. Very little happens without Vladimir Putin's OK. Well, I, I think that's an, that's an interesting statement. I think it's worth pursuing. I'm sure the president will want to pursue means? it. Midterms are just months away, and there are still unanswered questions about how to protect this year's elections and who is responsible for doing so. Editor-in-chief of CNET News, Connie Guglielmo, is in San Francisco, and senior writer at Wired, Issy Lepowski, joins me here on set. Thanks to both of you. Connie. 
are lawmakers working with Silicon Valley ahead of midterms to prevent any potential interference? Well, I guess it depends on how you define working together. What we understand is that eight of the major tech companies held a meeting at Facebook in May and reached out to the Department of Homeland Security to find out if there could be some dialogue and communication. And that really didn't seem to be the case. The, what we understand from the reports were, and again, this is just according to sources, nobody who was at the meeting spoke out, but the Department of Homeland Security was uh, reluctant to talk about what kind of tactics or issues they were seeing ahead of the midterms, and that led to some frustration on the part of the tech companies who obviously want to know what they need to prepare for and to brace for. Yeah, which comes to the whole, which brings up the whole question of who's responsible here, right? I mean, Izzy, who feels more responsible here, the tech companies or Congress? I feel like tech companies think they're responsible for what happens on their own platforms, mm -hmm. but they're more than happy to point the finger at somebody else if they screw up on their platform. So, you know, they're, they're dissatisfied with what Washington is bringing to them. They're saying, bring us more information, more intelligence. And they're also throwing each other under the bus. They're not working together. It's not a collaboration between all these tech companies. It is yes. really every man for off. So, Izzy, we watched so carefully when Mark Zuckerberg was questioned by Congress through his congressional hearings, and it seemed often that lawmakers did not quite understand the technology. They did not often even understand the questions they were asking, it appeared. So, do we have more clarity now? Is Congress clearer on what exactly it's expecting? tech companies to do? I really doubt it. There's been this sort of adversarial antagonistic relationship between Washington and Silicon Valley and we saw it obviously live in those hearings but since then it's been going on in this sort of paper trail. Uh, Congress asked Facebook to answer all these questions and they have you know repeatedly released 500 pages at a time, 700 pages at a time. It's really uh, impenetrable and in some cases doesn't answer half the questions that are I in was going to say has Facebook gotten back on every single question that they that Mark Zuckerberg said we'll get back to you on? Absolutely not. They, I mean, they selectively have answered and they've certainly turned out a vast volume. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on Friday night they released over 700 pages of answers. But if you look at any one of those given answers, they're dodges, they're ducks. Um, we do learn more and more as these questions keep being answered, but I think there's certainly a lot more to dig through there. So, Connie, how important is it to bolster security ahead of midterms? As an outside observer of the tech industry, what do you think needs to happen? Well, we're talking about two things. We're talking about the threat to our election systems. That's vote tampering and state governments having their systems being tampered with and basically hacked. But the bigger issue, and the one that we saw in 2016, had nothing to do with hacking. It was misinformation and fake news and ads that were right. pretending to be, you know, about a certain cause, trying to sway public opinion. So one of them is actually a tech issue where you're preventing a hack, a cybersecurity threat. And we know that the government is working with states to try to bolster the systems to give people confidence that when they vote, that their vote is not going to be tampered with. But the bigger issue, the one that Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, and others face is the fake news, the propaganda aspect of what's happening. And have you seen improvement there? I mean, there's been a lot of press about, you know, closing accounts and, and rooting out the bots. Have you seen some improvement? Well, we've seen some efforts. What mm -hmm. we've seen are efforts around advertising, for instance, where Facebook, Twitter have said that they're going to crack down on advertisers, get more transparency and disclosure about who's advertising, who's paying for the ads. But that's only a small percentage of the fake posts and the misinformation that was spread. It was not all advertising. So baby step, but really still a massive issue. So you think the bots are still at it? Absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. So, uh, Izzy, what should President Trump talk about when he, when he presses or hopefully presses Vladimir Putin on this issue? Should he press the Russian president on it? Absolutely. I mean, I think the fact that John Bolton is saying, oh, the president will look forward to doing that is sort of, it's a little too late for that, right? right. Like, we're almost two years out. Uh, and I want to go back to what Connie said. Yes, it's in misinformation. Yes, it's fake news. But we did have some really uh, big Russian-driven hacks during the 2016 election. The yes. DNC was hacked. Uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman was hacked. And those had very material impacts on the election. So I think that uh, President Trump is going to have to look at both sides of this issue when he talks to, to Vladimir Putin. And looking at the upcoming elections, the midterms, is there any evidence that the Russians have been meddling already? 
Well, the intelligence community says yes, they're doing it now, they're absolutely active. Uh, if you ask Facebook, they say we haven't necessarily found any evidence of this, but we're actively looking, we're developing technology that's looking, they're you know, saying that they're practicing vigilance. But mm -hmm. I think that you know, the agency, the internet research agency that we saw spreading all this propaganda in 2016 is getting a lot better at covering the tracks. Yep. They're using technology that doesn't just show you know, where they're located, they're not paying in rubles, they're, not, uh, they're communicating in different languages. So uh, I think that they're learning from the insights that we have learned from. Connie, is that what your reporting is telling you as well, that it's already happening? Yes, absolutely. And the intelligence agencies themselves here in the U.S. have said it's pervasive. So what 2016 was a test run to see how successful they could be with meddling and manipulation. And over the past two years, they've just continued to perfect. And as Izzy said, they've gotten better at hiding their tracks, which makes them more difficult to find and suss out, even from uh, you know, smart companies like Facebook and Twitter. And if you don't have the government telling you what they're seeing, and you don't have an administration that recognizes that it's a real problem that they need to address, then you're in a situation where we have to just really be cautious about what's happening before the midterm elections. Absolutely. Connie and Izzy, thanks to both of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, even though Barack Obama has been laying low since President Trump took office, the former mayor of L.A., Antonio Villarroso, says Mr. Obama's voice is increasingly important in the midterms. That's next. You're streaming Red and Blue on CBSN. As Democrats gear up for the midterms, some are wondering, where is Barack Obama? The former president has remained largely out of the spotlight. He emerged last week to attend a Democratic National Committee fundraiser in California, where he reportedly urged Democrats to mobilize and said they have a right to be concerned. He's now expected to play an active role helping Democrats in competitive races ahead of November's elections. Recently, my colleague Elaine Quijano spoke with former Los Angeles mayor Antonio Villaragoso about the party's future moving forward. Let me start by asking you about former President Obama. What is it that you would like to see from him going into the midterms? Do you think that he can be used effectively on the campaign trail? I think, I think he can be used effectively. Uh, I think uh, President Obama uh, is one of the most significant uh, Democrats, probably the most significant uh, currently, and, and I think his voice is important, particularly right now when people are feeling uh, fairly concerned, uh, in fact, uh, I think traumatized by the notion that uh, Donald Trump's going to be able to pick the, another Supreme Court justice and move it even farther to the right than the court already is. I think there's a lot at stake uh, in the midterms, and there's, I think a lot of people are uh, looking for uh, President Obama's voice. Uh, as you know, President Obama has remained relatively quiet despite some very sharp criticisms from President Trump. Um, would you like to see more forceful pushback from President Obama? Look. Uh, the president had his eight years. I understand that. I was mayor for eight years. Uh, you, you don't sit and criticize the other uh, person who takes your place uh, constantly. I think that would be a waste of his time and a waste of uh, his effort. I do think it is important uh, that he speak out as he has, uh, and particularly uh, in these times. Uh, I read uh, in the New York Times where Many are describing, uh, you know, what we're looking at today in America is on the threshold of a, the Gilded Age, uh, where so many people are left behind. And I think it is important that our party and uh, that uh, President Obama's voice be heard, uh, particularly around the notion of what we do to grow together as a country. Uh, our politics are very polarized. Uh, both parties are uh, going through a, a disruptive period. And I think people are looking for uh, the kind of bridge builders, uh, the, the healers, if you will, that uh, President Obama represented. 
Mayor, I'd like to ask about your own political path. You ran for governor of California and came in third in the primary. And I know you've had some time to reflect. What is it that, in hindsight now, looking back, you think went wrong for your campaign? Well, actually, Elena, I've spent uh, almost all my time in the last uh, three and a half weeks thanking people. I, I tell people I was blessed to have had uh, thousands of people uh, get behind my candidacy, and I've written some 1,300 uh, handwritten notes and, um, and made calls to people, so that's what I've spent my time on. I haven't had an opportunity to really look back. Uh, I'm a guy that always looks forward, but it's clear that uh, the Trump endorsement of uh, uh, John Cox uh, uh, catapulted him from third uh, to second, and knocked me out of the uh, general, and so uh, it is what it is. I think uh, clearly a, a vote for uh, John Cox is a vote for uh, Donald Trump, which is why I endorsed uh, Gavin Newsom on the night of uh, my election uh, results and, and again a couple of weeks later. So I'm not looking back uh, to the election. I obviously want to stay involved. Uh, uh, in addition to wanting to come in on your program because it was you who was hosting it, uh, I think it's important that we talk about what we do in our party and our country at this time. Uh, I think uh, in specifically, Democrats need to talk a lot more about the economy uh, and about the fact that the economy is not working uh, for too many people. I think we have to acknowledge that we have a problem with the white male voters and speaking about the economy in a way that brings us all in, I, I think, is important. I think this party's got to also uh, work a lot harder to energize uh, communities of color, particularly the Latino community, uh, who don't come out in the numbers that we need. Um, and so uh, I prefer looking forward, not backward. Uh, and that's what I'm going to spend my time doing. So on that note, to follow up on what you just laid out, what do you think Democrats need to do, particularly with respect to Latino voters, to engage them um, more than they have? Well, I think generally, as a general proposition, uh, Democrats have to focus a lot more on the economy. Uh, we can't lose white males the way that we're doing currently, nationally and in uh, California. Uh, when you talk about the economy, the economy is affecting everyone. Uh, I also think uh, that we need to focus, with respect to Latino voters, we need to focus on bread and butter issues like the economy, but also education. Uh, a big reason why um, not enough uh, Latinos uh, are in jobs that pay a uh, middle class wage is because we're not graduating enough from our high schools. When I was mayor, I took on our schools and we went from a 44% graduation rate to a 72%, but that's not good enough. We need to be graduating all of our kids, make them college ready, and give them a skill that they need to succeed. And I think, in addition, you can't just focus on Latino voters every four years or during the midterms. Yet we really got to work hard uh, at educating voters, at, at really mo mobilizing them throughout and working with them. And I don't think the party's done that uh, well enough. I've often said that, uh, uh, you know, Republicans demonize uh, Latinos, and, and in many respects, uh, the Democratic Party uh, sees them as invisible. Uh, and uh, making those investments in the long term, generating young leadership and new leadership uh, in those communities, I think is going to be very important for our party and for our country, particularly as the, the demographics could uh, continue to change. All right. Former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Mr. Mayor, thanks very much for your time. Lane, always good to be on the show with you, and uh, please invite me again. We're taking a look at local matters in Missouri, where Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill is trying to hold on to her seat while navigating a Supreme Court nomination hearing. And Mexican voters overwhelmingly elected the country's first leftist president in decades. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador won in a landslide. Even President Trump is congratulating him. Stay with us. This is Red and Blue.
going to try and do very hard. I think he's going to try and help us with uh, border. We have unbelievably bad border laws, uh, immigration laws, the weakest in the world, laughed at by everybody in the world. Uh, and Mexico has very strong immigration laws, so they can help us until we straighten out our immigration laws, which have been bad for many, many years, decades. And we're going to have them taken care of. President Trump says he spoke with Mexico's president-elect for about a half an hour Monday. Mr. Trump said the pair discussed border security, trade, and NAFTA, and called it a, quote, good conversation. Andres Manuel López Obrador won more than 50 percent of the vote on Sunday after campaigning on ousting the, quote, mafia of power ruling Mexico and on standing up to President Trump. Here's Will Grant from our broadcast partners at BBC News. Andres Manuel López Obrador has waited 12 years for this moment. Having narrowly missed out on the presidency in 2006, this was a victory he savoured. In many ways, though, he's waited a lifetime. From the moment he burst onto the political scene as a left-wing activist, he clearly wanted the presidency. Now, at the third attempt, it is his. The campaign might have been the bloodiest in Mexico's history, but the vote itself passed off peacefully, at least in most polling stations. In Aragon, a low-income neighborhood in Mexico City, queues were orderly and voters patient, keen to exercise their democratic right to show their displeasure to the governing party. The word on the lips of many voters in Mexico is change. Not just change in the party in power or the president, but a more fundamental shift in the political and economic direction of the country. In particular, change is wanted in those parts of Mexico where the drug cartels, rather than the state, rules. Mr. López Obrador's win is largely because he promised to tackle the ingrained corruption and violence. Economically, too, his supporters are hopeful he can begin to redress the balance in one of the most unequal societies in the Americas. It is a daunting task ahead, but for now his supporters are delirious with joy. He and his party faithful have decimated the two main parties in Mexico and in the process completely redrawn the political map of the country. In campaign 2018 local matters, the Senate race in Missouri is heating up. Incumbent Senator Claire McCaskill is heavily favored to win the Democratic primary next month. However, she's expected to face a serious challenge from Missouri's Attorney General, Republican Josh Hawley. The upcoming Supreme Court nomination is now front and center in this race. Earlier, my colleague Elaine Quijano spoke with Joe Manis, a political reporter for St. Louis Public Radio. Senator McCaskill is one of a handful of red state Democrats who will likely face intense pressure over the Supreme Court nomination. After opposing Neil Gorsuch's appointment, how is she responding to the looming confirmation battle this time around? Um, I think in some ways she wants to wait until uh, President Trump actually comes out with a nominee. So then she has somebody to focus on as opposed to generalities. However, in 2012, she ended up making reproductive rights a key part of her campaign. So I think it might be difficult for her to try to uh, step back from that this time. So I suspect that even though it may uh, hurt some of her following in rural Missouri, I think overall she sees that it probably is the smartest move for her to stick with uh, her support of abortion rights. Holly, on the other hand, has been a major player in the uh, abortion reproductive fight for years. Um, he was one of the lawyers in the Hobby Lobby case, where the Supreme Court ruled that uh, corporations don't have to provide uh, contraception if it's against their religious beliefs. And he has highlighted that. He has highlighted his opposition to abortion. So I think you're going to see a very pure philosophical fight over this. Interesting. Well, Holly does not have the same name recognition as Senator McCaskill, and she has outraised him five to one. How are both candidates campaigning, and what is Holly doing to raise his profile? Well, a couple things that he is doing. He has done some targeted appearances. He's had some rallies, different spots. He has tr he's trying hard to show a stronger uh, money-raising quarter. As you know, the deadline was yesterday. 
So in a couple weeks, we'll see how well he's done. But he, he does have two shortcomings. A, he doesn't have her name recognition, for good or bad. B, she has outraised him so much that um, while she's been careful how she's spending her money, there's a lot of outside groups spending on both sides. But I would say that uh, Chuck Schumer and some of his groups are doing a, a very strong negative Holly campaign right now, running a lot of negative ads against him for various uh, money-raising things. But the bottom line is, I think it's gotten very personal and very intense pretty quickly. Well, both candidates agree on at least one thing, the importance of health care. Both are making it a top priority in their race this year. What are their views on this issue? Okay, and this is where it gets extremely interesting. Uh, Claire McCaskill has really highlighted health care, in part because she did over 50 town halls in the last year, many of them in rural Missouri, and quickly figured out that health care was one of the big issues, especially for middle-aged and older uh, Missourians. So she particularly has been highlighting her support for protecting pre-existing conditions, for example. And at a major speech at the biggest Democratic event of the year last week, she um, called on everyone with pre-existing conditions to stand up, and almost everybody in the room did. I actually tweeted a picture of it. It ended up going viral. I had oh. more uh, re retweets on that than on anything. Oh. Now. Holly is part of a lawsuit that was filed by roughly 20 uh, attorney generals around the country to pretty much get rid of the rest of the mandates of uh, the Affordable Care Act, including the protections for pre-existing conditions. But when I asked him about this about a week and a half ago, he said that he definitely supports protecting pre-existing conditions, but he said Congress needs to act to do it. And he said that one of the reasons they haven't done it is because of people like McCaskill. So they're both trying to uh, position themselves as being a protector of health care, but they're taking it from different perspectives. Holly has made very clear that he's a big supporter of President Donald Trump, who has been here once to campaign for him and who is expected to be here again sometime this summer. Holly has really made that a strong part of his campaign that he supports Trump and much of what he stands for. Fascinating. Well, speaking of President Trump, he won, of course, more than 56 percent of the vote in Missouri, but his recent steel tariffs resulted in the largest nail manufacturer in the U.S., located in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, to lay off dozens of workers. What impact do you expect the president to have on Missouri voters in November? Well, I think some of it's too early, but I think what's happening is that you're seeing many of his rural supporters uh, farmers, for example, many of them are starting to get hit because of this tariff, uh, the backlash, where some of their overseas markets, I mean, Missouri's, one of its top uh, uh, traders is Canada. So a lot mm -hmm. of farmers here send products up to Canada or send it to China. That's another big one. So I think many of them are getting fearful because they're seeing uh, that this could affect their bottom line. Now, whether or not that will affect their support for the president, I think has yet to be seen. But there's a lot of public comments, concern about this. I think they're hoping that maybe he'll back off. So many politicos, very interested to see what happens in your state. Joe Manis, thank you for your insight. Well, thank you so much for asking me. I appreciate it. And that does it for this edition of Red and Blue. Elaine Quijano will be back Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm Tanya Rivero, and you're streaming CBSN.